Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 We try not to just take style before we know how old they are and before what questions they might answer and so we like to core in through the bottom of a style using this um, and we'll just take the centre piece from the middle of the style and date that and then use the rest to plug the hole again. We are a long way from the, the boundary between the grit stone and the limestone. The water went, that went through here was from a sinking stream. Uh, but the nearest stream sinks are several kilometres away. So basically this has to be very ancient. Also its height above the Lathkill is down there. It's a lot lower than this. This is a very old passage. We know that almost from the start just by its, its geomorphological context. Steve Worthington did a quick calculation suggested you've got to have at least a million years for that amount of down cutting. What I'd like us to do is, is obviously to go up and have a look at these. Yeah. But also, if we've got time, the bit of flowstone to be cored is about there. But this is a lead miner's shaft which drops straight into the into the natural. So the lead miners must have been in by some other route, which we don't quite know which route that was yet. <laughs> Up until thinking about the potential for ice breakage, we'd tentatively said, was there a tectonic event between 87 and yeah. 83,000 years yeah. ago? Which we still can't rule out. Completely. We still can't rule out completely. Yeah. It's no. interesting that growth stops at 45. We might find that this is when we start to really get in, maybe the CCCs start appearing then when we've got permafrost and stuff. And so the yeah. style. But the question is, was there any any spell of intense cold between 87 and 83? Yeah. The onset of Northern Hemisphere glaciation after the last interglacial was 180,000. Sea levels were already really? dropping by then. So 5E is the interglacial. And that's 130 to 120. Yes. So yeah. after 5E, we're into 5D, which yeah. is when sea level starts to drop and the ice sheets start to grow again. Right. 5C warms up a little bit yes. again, we've got an interstadial, 5B cold again, 5A a bit warm again, and stage 4 is when we really start to get into the ah. full-on glaciation and when it gets really cold. 4, 3, 2. Well, there were two things. One is to find the oldest style in the place. Yeah. Um, and the second is to look at the broken style. In the vicinity of number 15, Derek's got three dates greater than 350k. Some dates here uh, that are on stalactites broken and on the floor. There is a gap between, if we round it off, 87 and 83. Yes. And we, that's when I think the breakage occurred. Okay. There were shot holes. They were breaking off the calcite. And there, look. Oh, yeah. Okay. There's a lovely big chunk of calcite there as well, isn't it? Yeah. For them to yeah. Have, have a go at. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to see that yeah. as we get beyond. And another one here. Yeah. yeah. And some of them, there's also some quite good style of them. No, I've been surprised if you I've never stood just here and looked up. It's exactly like that. The Anco prop, the, uh, the scaffold your head. Oh, right. that boulder. Okay, okay. We've climbed up a boulder choke, gone through the top of it and back down the other side. Yeah. We're at the junction of uh, Urchin Passage and Chirty 2 Passage. The big difference is that whereas up to the boulder choke, the lead miner had been through it. 
So it's difficult to determine uh, or separate uh, the results of mining from what might have been there when the miner himself arrived. Here we're in a passage that we know is in its natural state and that's really important. As soon as we get to this part of the cave, fractured rock everywhere and the real question is what has caused all of this fracturing? You can see here that the flowstone sheet was obviously continuous and it's just like a fault has opened up and separated the rock off. This piece of rock would have been level with that piece of rock just there. So we're going to see this all the way through. The speleothem and dating the speleothem will help us to understand when it happened. We've got a massive fracture here, which we don't know exactly what caused that. Um, could be due to ice, could be due to an earthquake or something. But if we look, we've looked around the rest of the cave in this area, which we know is untouched by miners, you've got very angular boulders. And this can often be an indication of freeze-thaw processes that have happened in the roof and that cause the boulders to come down. Um, and then also, when we first came into the passage, there was a lot of mud on the floor that was kind of fluffy. And that's often due to ice processes as well. So water gets into the mud, it freezes, it expands, and you get these like, little fluffy mud that falls. So these are all indications that there may have been ice in here at one point. But here, on the floor, we have definitive evidence, unambiguous evidence, that we had ice here. And this white stuff that kind of looks like breadcrumbs on the floor is actually a calcite. It's what we call cryogenic cave calcite. And this falls specifically when you've got water that's able to enter a cave. So it's still warm enough on the surface in the summer, for instance. Uh, but the mean annual temperature is zero or below, so the cave air temperature is freezing or below. When that water enters, it will freeze and form and turn to ice. But in that process of freezing, all the carbonate ions in that water pool will become more and more concentrated to the point that eventually it precipitates out. And then this is what we're left with, this cryogenic cave calcite. So since then the ice has all melted away, but this has stayed behind. And we've got several different morphologies which you might like to look at. Fine white powder. Uh, we've got some sort of more brown uh, crystalline structures here. We've got a really huge, big brown kind of conglomerate one as well. Um, nearly all the caves I've visited, the cavers have said we recognise this was special and interesting and different and they've taped them off and preserved them. Um, for many decades I was even in um, Upper Canada Cave in Mendip. They were recognised in the 90s and no one knew what they were. And now we've just had a, an answer really, which has come from the Eastern Europeans who've been working in Slovakia and places where they really started to look at what, what these features were. I have to go to the University of Minnesota in America. I would hope by spring next year, I think I'll probably do the work myself. Can imagine why, yeah. <laughs> so, John, your samples are mostly called something like WICC 1, 2, 3, 4, or something yes. like that. So, I'm thinking for this, I'll go for WICC and then CCC 1, 2, 3. So Sounds that we good. And then I'll take some water samples as well, which I'll call WICC, W1, W2. WICC, CCC1, so the first sample from the cave of CCCs. I'm going to take uh, a few crystals from this patch here where we've got kind of small brown, very crystalline looking ones as opposed to the powder. That'll be a separate one. And I really don't need a lot of material. I only need... Uh, maybe a teaspoon's worth. You'll see that they're, not, they're very loose, they're not stuck. You don't need a lot for dating. Thin flowstone that's underneath. It could be quite interesting to date this thin calcite layer underneath as well. I mean, maybe that was formed as well in the cryogenic process. 
Do you think that's some of the fallen calcite? I'm just wondering if what you've had is, is some of these blocks have fallen. Directly above you, Gina, yeah. there's a failure along that line there. Yeah. And you see above that is quite clear calcite, yeah. which ends on the failure line. Yeah. And it could be, looking only at the position it's fallen, that it's actually a straight fall down. Yeah. You've got the flowstone, you've got some CCCs on top, and actually you can see the, the boulder underneath. But these are really quite large CCCs. So that's about a centimetre across? It is, yeah. Is that a single crystal, Gina? No, it's many. No. As it's lying in the gradually freezing water, yes. you get supersaturation and then crystal coalescence. Well, this is it. We don't really know. One of the next important things is going to be to try and grow these things. Oh, wow. And create synthetic yeah. ones in a lab. My colleague Mark Luch is working on that. More than, much more than I need for dating, so I'll leave yeah. it here because I don't need that. But it's still interesting to see it. And the plan is to have a PhD student working on this. I'm trying to collect... Oh, here, I'm just collecting drip water. So the drip water is... Just to have a modern reference value for um, what, what's in the water that's coming in today, basically. So... Oxygen and carbon, which are the two standard things that we tend to work with in uh, video research. Yeah. Clearly, once a massive stalactite, we look on the floor, where is it? I mean, okay, so it's fallen down, where's it gone? So one of the things we haven't done is actually seen what the most recent date is on some of this here. That could be a bit of it, couldn't it? Although if you look at the end of it, the end of it's not being broke. Mind you, that's probably recent overgrowth. Some of that could still be settlement and shrinkage. Every time you stop, you see things. So where are these CCCs this time? Right on this boulder. It's just... oh yeah. This has got, yeah, quite a mixture in. Um, the other side, they were still quite... They were like separate patches of the different types. Here they're really mixed in together. You've got like white powder here, and then the brownish large crystalline forms in with them. Uh, we got bored of finding them in the forest of Dean because they were every two feet. Oh, here's some more. Oh, here's some more. Oh, here's some more. <laughs> it's nice to have several separate patches because they may well be different ages. I would have thought if there was really ice all the way down, we'd have more evidence of CCCs all the way up. Drips coming down and freezing in situ, forming lobes. Yeah. Of What I've just realised is where we were in the first part, we were all underneath all that breakdown. Yeah, Here we're clearly going, underneath, underneath some that. sort of avon. This is what we found in wet sink. There were isolated patches always underneath some sort of avon or fire. The water's coming down through the avon. Yes, probably in the summer when there's enough thaw on the surface that the ground defrosts enough that the water can be able to flow down and into the cave where it would then freeze. It's the stuff that's dissolved from above, the 30 metres or so, yep. that then concentrates. Yes. Uh, this is more powdery, um, which means it's possibly formed not quite through the process of freezing a pool of water, possibly more to do with a, an airflow and a kind of an, an evaporative drying. I think that's the hypothesis for when you get a more powdery kind of CCC. We found that we can't date these very well for whatever reason. It's just it's just harder. Um, but I will take some and, and try. And see. But yeah, indeed, there is no obvious avon here, is there, for where it would have come in? So maybe it was a pool of water in here, 
about some airflow through the cave, which is kind of yeah, yeah kind of out. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 It's clearly tilted. It's not in its growth position, no. is it? Because the growth right. position would have been up there. The sediment, you get, you get a stalagmite boss growing on it. There's some erosion of the sediment. The stalagmite boss moves, tilts a bit, cracks. I find mm. it very difficult to, to know whether these cracks are just settlement cracks or cryogenics. I'd yeah. initially looked at this and say this is full calcite. Yeah. And that's why it's the sort of... How we distinguish that from the cryogenic calcite? Yeah. Some of these, yeah. if I was just looking at them, I would just say they were pool deposits. Yes. By nature, they are all pool deposits. I've seen pool deposits like that yeah. in tropical areas that clearly aren't the result of yeah. cryogenic. Yeah. You can look at the, um, the stable isotopes are quite distinctive. They have a very yeah, distinctive isotopic signature. When the sediment came in, it came in under Beidou's conditions, or as some form of a slurry. There are rounded fluvial class, possibly even some that are born to sandstone. In and amongst them, there are much more angular classes. So it needs a sedimentologist to do some detailed work on it. That's much more recent. Yes. In fact, the other thing that could be is condensation corrosion. How familiar are you with condensation corrosion, Gina? See it. Survey to see where, whether these really are at the same elevation. Yeah. And then we've got one of these classic fractured and re cemented style features. Really big. This, this, one. this is quite an extraordinary one here, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And to understand a, a quarter of what's going on down here. Is it, how big that one is there, Gina, the, the fallen column? You got this Avon, which I think has fractured it and piled the stuff at the bottom. And there it is, there's the pile. And if you think, well, that's a one off, no, it isn't. Look, Ooh. there's the second one. Yeah. Just did the first rating of the piece oh, yeah. over here. Okay. And it was much younger than we thought. So 67 at the bottom, 54 at the top. Do you see how well rounded yes. they are? Yeah. But there are also some that are definite sandstone. Right. There's clasts in here which look awfully like Brassington formation. Right. It could have come in as till. How beautifully rounded that is now, that looks like limestone, but that's fluvial. Or, I suppose, just possibly fluvio-glacial. But if glacial, the last ice was uh, whatever the Anglians called now, 400,000 years 400, ago. 400 is stage 11, which is 11. A, a warm period, so... Right. But there was... stage 12 was a very severe glaciation. That's the one then, 12. Yeah. Look how high it was once up the walls of the passage. So you can perhaps envisage some washing out of the finer sediment. That's all this beautiful crystalline structure. But the whole passage is a complete puzzle. When we look up here, look how this is redissolving. So clearly you've got aggressive water coming through now. It's not depositing, it's actually uh, eroding. It needs somebody to spend a lot of time down here to look at the lithologies, what the provenance could be. If we think that is in situ and it's not been remobilised by a recent flood, it would make sense to sample that, wouldn't it, and date the calcite underneath and then at least you'd have a... Well, that's what we've effectively done on this. Because yeah. we took a, a chunk of this out okay. to date it. And this is on top of... Rounded material, yep, isn't it? Absolutely. But that rounded material is the other way around there. It's Where can there possibly have been water to make a flood here? Yeah. This, this is as drippy as it gets. Yeah. So there's no stream. Thank you.
I'll be perfectly honest, I really don't know what's been going on here. Just pull the top to find out when it's stopped. A small core into here. And you plug the hole afterwards and no one would ever know. You core through there, you'd date the overgrowth and, and the under. The boss underneath. Under yeah. Really interesting. Yeah. here yes. as well. Yes, you do yeah. in a couple of This. It's hard to think how you could actually have ice in this passage. If, if ice had been somehow moving in this passage, there are lots of other caves in the Peak District where you'd expect the same thing. And we just don't see anything like it. Well, the um, same argument for earthquakes. If you've got an earthquake that's going to break that sort of structure, you're dealing with a very, very high impact earthquake. To break this, you certainly are. And so, so something this size would affect the whole of Derbyshire. And if you look at that one, it's been moved laterally. It hasn't been rolled down a slope. It's been moved sideways, but the obvious place for it to go, if it was going to topple, is not there. You have to go through the series of options. Occam's razor, isn't it? Let's start with the easy one. Is it human interference? No. Is it liquid water flow? No, that do it? unless okay. the only way that water flow could do it would be if it was carrying cobbles with it. Indeed. And there's no evidence of those anywhere. So it's not a, a low water content, high density slurry. There would be a degree of rounding just on the margins, but it would be there. If it were tectonic, there would be a lot more than in this cave. It's far, far too local. Is there any evidence that gravitational collapse could have occurred. It's not going to create this sort of structure. We can discount marine, I think. Yes, uh, yes. Could ice create the processes that we're looking at? Ice is plastic. It moves not because it's a glacier, but because when it melts and refreezes, there's an expansion of 10%. And we got plenty of evidence of ice heave in terms of boulders fracturing. What would be the effect of the same sort of process if the water starts to inhabit a passage which does contain fragile formations? The ice will take out anything that is stuck up into it. And even the slight sagging of the ice will break it off even against strong surfaces. Although I can't configure the ice in this passage, I can't think of anything else that would do it. I'm just trying to assimilate all the evidence around because you've also got fractured material, re-cemented yeah, material in here. You've got fractured in here as well. An indicator of a certain amount of expansion and contraction which could be associated with ice. We've got our air vent line here and yet another of these avens. This. Yeah was growing over there and has been knocked off. Yeah. So if we date this, then yeah. we get an idea that formed after it. Just an interesting access point for water. Mmm. Perhaps down here. Uh, that's very interesting, isn't it? Yes. So this is just for general dating of the, the cave, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. So that would be an ideal thing to call. We want water to flush through the drilling system, otherwise it all gets clogged John, up. John is bringing us on that. So I will clean off the face a bit as well. I need a helper to help with the pumping of the water. Dirty hands. Has anyone got clean hands? <laughs> I've got some gloves here if you want them. But... That's the outer piece, isn't it? The calcite's coming out clean. Oh, what a sweet little geological hand. I know, it's cute. Isn't it? yeah. yeah, it's cool. The, what you've got there is, is all I need for dating, actually. Ooh. There we go. Ooh. There's a bit in there still. I'm going to try and fish out the bit that's still in the hole. You know. You've got a little paper there, 
why I'm not so concerned about yeah, the yeah. order. Okay. Um, but that's probably the cleanest. Drop that in there. Mm -hmm. right. Maybe not. I'm not going to tip my hand over. That would be, I suspect, <laughs> counterproductive. Possibly. John, what would you like to call this? <laughs> 17. Sediment that's in here is obviously younger and that is older. The okay. question I'm asking myself is whether it's in situ and whether this is in situ. Now that should be older. Shouldn't it? I could drill into that. That was just what I was wondering. Yeah, well that makes sense. Well, I don't think we've got much further down than no. like the, possibly what's the back of here. Oh, I see. I think it's the one that was sampled in the early 1980s and then dated by Derek Ford, and he got a greater than 350,000 date on it. Right. But actually, well, if we can get that whole piece, that's the best thing, then, isn't it? Well, look at it. Come on. When I looked at this originally, I thought that was a lump of limestone, but now I can see it's not a calcite. Might be worth, rather than lofting this off, yeah. drilling in here. Just have a drill in there and see what you can get. Getting something out that we're not quite about. Did you not get a sample from that one at all? No. Yeah. It's gone to gunge. Oh, this is what science is like, isn't it? Yeah, it's the reality of science, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, yeah. yeah. Not all uh, lab coats are major discoveries, unfortunately. <laughs> We've run out of time. I could push that in. So it's uh, going to take us a while to get up the shaft. The, the, the higher CO2, you know, that when, it, when it's bad, it's higher up the shaft. It gets worse oh, and yeah. easier to push it up. Is that so? I think it's actually coming in through the engine. You must have done it before. Lean on the wall and go for it. Yeah.